everyone. This is the House Healthcare Committee. Um, this morning, and for, let me start by, uh, for committee members to appreciate your flexibility starting a half hour earlier than we had initially scheduled. Uh, I think that was, I've done that for several of them. I think that was today as well. Um, and today's agenda is to look at the follow-up on the use of coronavirus relief funds, the CR, which we refer to as CRF dollars. Um, we'll be following up on the use of CRF dollars, particular issues of health disparities, uh, something which this committee had a uh, great interest in in June when we were we were um, excuse me when we were allocating and then appropriating. Uh, a substantial amount of dollars for health care related issues. Um, I won't review right now exactly how we got where we were, but we, uh, one of the things that may be helpful is that to understand is that we had made some proposals from the House when it went to the Senate and came back through conference committee, the, we were reminded or told that the department, I think we had recommended a million dollars uh, from the house for health disparities. And we had a particular uh, set of issues that we thought should be prioritized. And when we came back, we understood, when we came back, went through a, a conferencing process, not a formal committee, uh, we were informed that the department of health had a particular grant um, and maybe uh, Sarah, I think Sarah will be able to maybe remind us of what that is. Uh, that would allow for uh, some grants, some grants to uh, groups around health disparities. And that's part of what we're looking to understand today. That I believe, as I recall, uh, there was to be rough, there was an additional half million dollars allocated out of CRF dollars. And there was to be an additional, um, 500,000 or more from a special grant, which hopefully Sarah can fill us in on. And that between those two uh, pots of money, that uh, the million dollars would be available for health disparities. So part of what we want to understand today, because a lot has happened in the meantime, uh, we, we all do our best at trying to make decisions and proposals. And what we want to do is first follow up with uh, the Department of Health uh, to understand what they have uh, set in motion to distribute dollars for health disparities. So we'll hear from Sarah, who will do me the favor of using her full name and we'll pronounce it properly then. Uh, and then after we hear from Sarah, we will then turn to uh, uh, Mercedes Avila, who is from the Governor's Task Force on Racial Equity. I think I have that right. Uh, but again, uh, because there was simultaneous with what we were doing, there was the governor had appointed a task force, and one of their first tasks was to look at issues of health disparities as it relates to COVID 19 in particular and recommendations. So we're very interested in hearing those, uh, hearing those recommendations. And then uh, we have time for. Uh, committee discussion and to consider whether there are whether there are further allocations of dollars that we might wish to make, uh, given that we were asked by the speaker to determine whether further allocations of any dollars, not just for this, but across this spectrum, uh, should be considered in the budget. And we've done some preliminary language to try to move us along if we need that later in the day or later in the morning. So I think that lays the groundwork. And with that, I'd like to first turn to welcome Sarah from the Department of Health. I apologize, Sarah. I'm, That's okay. Yeah. And so if you would, if you would, I'd appreciate if you would introduce yourself. And I also want to say I appreciate you're making yourself available today. I know that there was a request that we defer this testimony till next week. But given the time frame, we, we are charged, we and all the other committees of the House, because the House starts the budget. We have a much more 
we have much tighter time frame than the Senate. And we are charged with having any recommendations to the Appropriations Committee by the end of today. So that really was, <laughs> that's really, for both of you, that, that really frames what our, our needs are. And uh, we will do our best uh, to listen and then to think together and have some committee discussion uh, after hearing from both of you. And then I should just say that at the end, of, we're, we have two and a half hours today till 1230. Uh, I'm going to some ways reserve the last part of today's Zoom meeting to preview for the committee uh, the issues that we will be taking up starting tomorrow that I previewed in an email that has to do with uh, a proposal from the Department of Public Safety and mental health counselors uh, and where the speaker has asked our committee to take some test to take testimony and bring a recommendation. And we will be looking at language. We need to, we will create, we have crafted, we being the leadership of this committee, Representative Donahue, Representative Houghton, myself, have crafted some placeholder language in conjunction with the, our, our companions on appropriations that we will need to put into the budget today in anticipation of future testimony that we will be taking. This is all, it's a lot going on. Let's just say there's a lot going on. So I think I'll take a breath. And with that, I would welcome again, Sarah, thank you for joining us today on, sh on short notice. And I'm inviting you to introduce yourself and then uh, proceed with filling us in where we are with the allocation of dollars for health disparities from the health department. Excellent. Does that, does that work? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, my name is Sarah Chesbro. I work at the health department and in quote unquote normal times, my role is um, grant and program manager in the division of maternal and child health. Um, I've been involved in some health equity and community engagement activities at the health department for a few years, just as kind of a professional development opportunity. Um, and during this COVID response, we um, have mobilized the health operations center um, and in late May, um, I was deployed as the health equity technical advisor. So I'm here today um, as part of the health department's HOC effort. Um, my role there is to uh, lead a team of um, five other folks. So there's six, six of us half time um, who are dedicated to um, mitigating health disparities. And that means a lot of things. <laughs> um, yes, but one of, one of those things is to um, allocate funding out to our community partners and um, folks that can help us build trusting relationships with, um, with subpopulations in Vermont that experience health disparities. Um, and I just wanna express gratitude um, to you and, and to the entire legislature for appropriating this money um, for the health department to spend. I think we, um, it, it's, it's obviously a time to invest in this work. It's past time to invest in this work and we have been working toward these ends. And so um, this, this contribution to our budget is really uh, appreciated. And thank you for all your work on it. I'm happy to be here with all of you. And um, I could jump into a long spiel, but maybe I'll ask Chair Lippert or any of you if you, if you have any opening questions for me around the coronavirus relief funding. Well, maybe as an opening question, I could ask you to um, uh, help us understand the differentiation between what, and I don't, I don't have in front of me the name of the grant, but I understood that there was a special grant that the health department had received that yes. had, had uh, as a part of its goal, allocating some dollars, and we were told perhaps as much as a half million dollars, Yes. Uh, primarily, as I remember, toward more educational issues, et cetera, but I don't mm -hmm. I may have that wrong. Uh, if you could tell us about that grant. And then we spe separately had allocated, I believe, uh, $500,000 uh, for additional uh, distribution, more in line with what this committee's concerns were around actual working with groups that who's who who were impacted disproportionately or we were concerned would be impacted disproportionately by the COVID-19 virus 
and we were particularly interested in reaching out to groups that could do outreach and group groups which themselves were composed of people uh, affected. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's the best way to put it, but yeah. So if you could help us understand those two mm -hmm. group, two yes. amounts of money and how, how you proceeded with each. Sure. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, Representative Donahue has a question, I think, and she may, is that a question, Anne? Uh, well, I just uh, trying to a little clarity yeah. on those two pieces from my yeah. from I because I re-looked at it just the other day including the, the report from the Department of Health and I think that what happened is that the Department of Health said that the um, and, and I can get the name of it if you need but that first pot of money was already there for doing the educational outreach mm -hmm. Getting information that was well, that, 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 that's here from that's here from the Department sorry, of Health. Sorry. Let, oh, okay. Let, I, I thought there was a. If I misconstrued I it, that's what Sarah it. tried sorry. to sort it out. No, that's great. That's, she's that's, our witness. <laughs> that's thank you. That actually was what I would say an introduction. So I think the funding streams referred to are the the ELC. So that's the epidemiology and laboratory capacity. Thank you. Yeah, and enhanced detection grant. There's this long yes. acronym. So that's the piece. Um, I can speak more to the coronavirus relief funding, but what I can tell you about the ELC grant is that it is, um, if it has been appropriated to the health department, there is an implementation plan. I am not aware that spending from that grant has happened yet. Um, but what I do know that was that $640,000, that was so a little more than half a million, was set mm -hmm. aside for, as you said, Chair Lippert, um, subgrants to community organizations um, that work with marginalized people and especially um, the education and, and training for the health department on how right. best to be you know culturally sensitive um, responsive uh, language access issues um, so and I'm looking right at the language here we have um, we've asked that this money to be be spent on providing trainings on uh, racial equity for both folks in our central office and um, our regional district office staff, um, and especially to inform the work of the Health Operations Center. Right. So in that pot of money, and Shayla Livingston is, is probably the person at the health department to connect with, and I'm happy to make that connection and get you any answers um, that to, I don't have today. She's not available this week. She's so. not, yeah, she's out this week. Um, but um, my understanding is that, you know, probably what was expressed was that, you know, we've, we do have this chunk of money, um, it's to be spent here. The coronavirus relief funding would supplement that money. And um, I can tell you a little bit about the planned spending of the CRF, if that would be helpful. That would be helpful. That okay. Would be very helpful. Okay, wonderful. Um, so um, <clears throat> coronavirus relief funding is in the amount of $500,000. Um, we have some really great and clear language from the bill, especially around kind of those populations that we know experience adverse outcomes from COVID-19 uh, and what types of activities would be supported through this funding um, to help them meet their needs, their prevention needs and, and education needs. So um, we are planning to sub-award to five different entities um, with this pot of money. Um, each of the five sub-awards is in some process of near completion. <laughs> um, and I know you know the, the grind of, of getting grants out the door. So, um, and one of them is actually to, to Dr. Avila through Spectrum. And I wanted to um, talk a little bit about that, that award first. Um, it's the largest chunk of our award. And um, the health department has worked with Dr. Avila in a few capacities, mostly through our um, alcohol and drug abuse programming division. Um, and she has developed a cultural broker um, model and um, you know, supports a group of cultural brokers who are um, members of affected communities, share identities with affected communities and are um, essentially you know, community health workers and care managers with folks who I think are often kind of left out of um, broader health department outreach and education. Um, because maybe they have limited Eng English proficiency, there is not um, a great trust relationship built with, you know, state government or other entities. Um, and so, you know, we've, we have struggled in the past, the health department has really struggled in the past to um, know how to accurately message um, to, to different populations. And the cultural brokers <clears throat> um, will be, <clears throat> excuse me, contracted to help us kind of 
understand what what folks in particular new Americans um, refugee and immigrant populations what they understand about um, COVID-19 risk prevention um, also uh, you know quarantine and isolation and you know um, kind of the whole gamut of you know what to do um, <clears throat> we want to know kind of what people understand and where the gaps are and then what we could do to more specifically you know um, culturally um, appropriately target um, messaging to these populations so that everyone has the same information and access to the same services. So that's just a blip and I know Dr. Avila can tell you a ton more about the cultural brokers as well as the health disparities um, and cultural competency committee that she runs. Um, <clears throat> but that um, that was the first piece we worked on and so we're really grateful uh, to continue to work with, with Dr. Avila um, that started within ADAP. Um, Dr. Can Avila I, is also- I... Oh, yes. Can I just jump in here and say that, uh, Dr. Avila, if you, uh, I, I don't want to cut off Sarah, but uh, in a, we're fortunate to have you with us. Uh, and so in addition to your reporting to us about the task force recommendations, uh, perhaps you would be willing to help us understand more fully uh, the subgrant that uh, Sarah was just outlining as well. And I don't know, Sarah, would that be helpful to do that? That's briefly fine, now, yeah. if yeah, Dr. She, Avila, is, I'm suddenly putting you on the spot, but is that is that something that would be, you could give us a little more information on, in addition to what Sarah said? At this absolutely, time? and um, the grant is actually subawarded to Spectrum Youth and Family Services. They are the grant that has have um, um, almost a five-year contract with the Department of Health and ADAP to provide behavioral health um, screening and outreach to refugee and immigrant communities in the area. So uh, we have, the program has about um, six to seven cultural brokers from the refugee and immigrant communities that have been extensively trained in um, providing screening, case management, and support to the refugee communities. The, mo the model was created uh, based on best practice models or nationally that exist related to addressing health disparities related to community health outreach, community health workers. So it's one of them, it's the only program that we have in the state of Vermont specifically outreaching to refugee and immigrant communities related to um, health and behavioral health disparities. In the, the program has existed for five years and in the five years that the program has um, been in place, we, the cultural brokers have reached out to almost 4,000 refugee and immigrant communities uh, members in the area through screening, case management, and providing supports specifically around um, anything that has to do with the social determinants of health and intersecting issues related to social determinants of health. So we believe um, any of us, and there aren't that many people uh, in Vermont working in health equity. I think I'm one of the few people. Yes. So Vermont is a very Thank small you. state, so we're always going to be intersecting when we talk about health disparities. Um, mm -hmm. Those of us working in this field, I've been working in health equity field for almost two decades in Vermont. Uh, we strongly believe that we have to work with communities, and that work with communities means having community members hired work doing this work through our organizations and making the link between services and um, communities. I conducted a community needs assessment in 2014, identifying barriers to access to care. And that report is available online. I'm happy to share the link later on. It's a 40 page report with findings. We interviewed more than 100 refugee and immigrant community members. And the findings of the report one of the main recommendations was to have a cultural brokering program, having community members hire in that capacity to make the link between services and organizations. One of the biggest findings of the program was that community members did not know that, for example, mental health agencies existed, that uh, they were not aware of any program um, providing services. And if communities don't know that the programs exist, how are they going to access them? So I had um, several meetings at the time with the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Health, and um, a Spectrum stepped up 
and also created not only is not only supporting the cultural brokering program, but they also created the multicultural youth program, which is another program specifically working with refugee and immigrant children. So it's a perfect fit for this type of work with refugee and immigrant communities. And I'm happy to answer any more questions you might have um, after Sarah finishes presenting. Great. And that's very helpful. And it also helps us, helps me, I'll say, and perhaps others understand the connection or the nexus with Spectrum Youth and Family Services, which some of us would not have immediately identified with the broader set of uh, initiatives that you're describing. So this is, this is, this is, this is all very helpful information. Um, can I ask you one? Uh, I, I believe that I've taken in what we're using a term which I think is well, I won't, maybe it's jargon, but it's just a term that's unique to this discussion, a cultural broker. Uh, and maybe I would welcome either Sarah or uh, Dr. Avila to, to just be certain that we understand as we're having this conversation what, what, the, what the meaning is of using that term. So I'll, I'll leave it to the two of you to help us. I, I, I think I've absorbed it, but let's, let's be specific for those who might be listening, because we also have an audience on YouTube, and this will be on YouTube, and I think it's useful to And this is a, that's an important, it's an important question related to um, understanding this work. We, the, in Vermont, we chose the term cultural broker. There are other terms being used nationally, community health worker, community outreach worker. There are many different uh, terms that are similar. Uh, community health worker is the most commonly used term. The refugee community in Vermont chose cultural broker um, as a term because the community health worker was confusing uh, for some of the communities. So that was a decision that was made by the community to use that term. Essentially, um, cultural brokering means what the term is defining is making that bridge between programs and communities in a way that is culturally and linguistically responsive and sensitive, which means that we have community members working for our organizations, making the link between services and communities. It's one of the best practice national models in addressing and eliminating health disparities. And it has proven to be effective um, nationally, but also in Vermont, we have been able, as I mentioned, to reach out to almost 4,000 uh, refugee and immigrant communities and build trust. The other important piece of cultural brokering is that it helps build or rebuild trust in many cases related to addressing health disparities. As most of you know, in this committee, um, we have a long history of distrust with healthcare organizations through mm -hmm. some historical events like eugenics mm -hmm. uh, medic and ethical medical research. So most often it's effective to have community members explaining and providing that bridge and link and bro brokering between organizations and communities. And at the same time, they speak the language of the community. So we don't have to have an interpreter that so much is lost also when in interpretation and translation. So that's why it's such an effective process. And these six members of the community have built trust in such a way that they are, the communities reach out to them. The six cultural brokers we have in Vermont currently doing this program, they were also essential in ensuring that um, hundreds of community members went to the testing sites. It wouldn't have happened without that uh, process of having mm -hmm. cultural brokers calling families, picking them up in their homes, going home by home explaining what COVID was and being able to reach out and get them get the families to the COVID uh, testing sites. The, the work that the cultural brokers do is no different than case managers at the Association of Africans Living in Vermont or the USCRI Vermont chapter. They, they do similar work, but the more cultural brokers we have, the more trust and the more we're going to be able to break barriers to access uh, to healthcare and behavioral healthcare in the state. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Is there any, that, that's very, very helpful, and I think it's it's very useful to have spent uh, a minute or so, uh, several minutes, just to be as clear as possible. Because that's I think it intersects with, uh, in fact, uh, in different ways with some of the thoughts this committee had had, and we're I, that's 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 terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah, is there anything on that front that you would like to add? 
That was beautiful. Dr. Avila is definitely the, the expert yeah. there. I right. will just add that this is um, this is kind of a new funding model for the health department and something that I um, am bringing forward pretty aggressively that is that is really supported is this idea of um, we recognize that as the health department, we're not all things to all people. Our website is not accessible to lots of folks. You know, there are traditional ways that we have um, done outreach in the past that we just know are not reaching all Vermonters. So this idea of, um, yeah, hiring someone who shares a cultural identity that can more easily make connections to social services, healthcare, um, makes all the sense in the world um, and is, beginning to pick up momentum at the health department. So we're excited about this. Great. So I'm going to, I'm, I, as the chair of the committee, I'm kind of the manager of how we move along. And I see, and we, we I don't know if um, Sarah and, and uh, Dr. Avila, you can see, but we have, when we are on Zoom, uh, there's a process by which members of the committee can raise their hands virtually. And so I see three, well, two committee members uh, have their hands raised. So I think I'm gonna pause and hear what their questions are. And then we don't want to sidetrack uh, the completion of your testimony, Sarah, but I think this was this is a very useful uh, uh, addition to that to the first part of the grant. And maybe when we come back, you can actually uh, help us understand the amount of that grant as well. But sure. let me first uh, turn to Representative Cordes has her hand up, and then Representative Page has a question as well. Thank you, Chair, and thank you. Uh... Sarah and Dr. Avila. Dr. Avila, the work that you are leading is critical and I'm very grateful for your leadership um, and Sarah for your leadership in the, the health department. It, I had just have a comment um, that may or may not be helpful. The cultural brokers um, program sounds a lot to me like uh, an organization that I've worked alongside in Haiti and uh, Partners in Health, Paul Farmer's um, group uh, that lifted up the leaders in the community to build their own clinics, build their, um, provided them support so that the people actually living in the community were, were leading the efforts. Um, this was, um, Partners in Health or Zanmi La Sante had been in Haiti for, for years, but I was there after the earthquake. Um, so people that are interested in this model, if Dr. Avila, if you think that that's, am I correct in saying that that's a similar similar model and it might, if people are interested in it, it might be worth looking at, um, there's tons of really wonderful writing about that kind of work um, through Partners in Health. Absolutely, there are many different models um, within the United States and globally that um, show how working directly with the community increases participation in healthcare and behavioral healthcare uh, from the community. So I think that's a great example. I think we have many good examples in the in the United States as well, reaching out to historically underserved communities. Thank you for that example. Okay. Uh Representative Page, are you, I didn't cut you off, Mari. You, okay, uh, Representative Page, and then uh, I, I know there's other questions that maybe will come up after we've heard the presentation fully, but Representative Page, you have a question now. Yes, I have a couple of questions. Uh, okay. First off. And you need to speak up, Woody, because it, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, let me see if I can adjust my settings. Okay, how is that? Is that better? That's, that's actually better, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this grant, it, it's only for COVID education, is that correct? Nothing else? The way the bill was written is yes, that this is um, for purposes of emergency planning for, for because of the COVID pandemic. Okay, and is this state funding or is this something from outside, say like the State Department or UN Refugee Agency? No, this is um, it's, it's not connected to any of the latter that you mentioned. I believe it is um, federal funding that um, was allocated out to different agencies and departments in Vermont. Okay, so it is federal funding. And um, regarding the 4,000 in your communities, um, where are these communities? I'm assuming Burlington, Rutland area. Um, 
are are those the only primary uh, places that uh, your that your work uh, that you're working with? That's a good question, and I should probably let Dr. Avila chime in here. Um, obviously, um, we know that the majority of the refugee and immigrant population in Vermont is centered in Chittenden County, and so I believe a lot of the you know cultural broker work happens with families in Chittenden County. Um, there are resettled folks um, in other parts of the state, and I believe that the you know Dr. Avila's cultural broker model is um, it can be scaled statewide. It's intended to be um, a statewide resource, but I'll let you. Jump and, in if you don't mind, Dr. And then one, one other issue. Um, is the state receiving refugees presently? I know there was some talk about stopping that or delaying it or something like that. Mm -hmm. but I just, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. um, to the best of my knowledge, I actually just was CC'd on an email that there will be a moratorium on receiving any new um, individuals in October. Uh, and I think Dr. Avila probably knows more than I do, but we um, we have been accepting refugees and, and asylum seekers um, consistently for since, gosh, the late 90s. Dr. Avila, is there, would you want to comment on Representative Page's question about the scope of the outreach uh, across the state? And I, yeah, I, I, sh I what do you, can I say this in, in a way that's maybe slightly, uh, Woody's well, from the Northeast Kingdom. <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> that's not his only, no, and in fairness to Woody, that's not, that's not his only interest, but, but I just think it is important because things, Woody is, is an advocate for, Woody and others on our committee advocate for making sure that uh, issues are addressed across the state and not just in Chittenden County. I don't mean that in a demeaning way, Woody. I, seriously. I, and, I, and I know that, Chair. Thank okay, you very much. I just, so those who are listening may feel like I'm poking at you in a way that's not. Not at all. Okay. And I can share briefly, um, and I know Sarah can add more about this, the cultural brokering program is one of um, the several initiatives that are, are going to be funded through CRF, reaching many different communities. Refugee and immigrants is um, one of the communities that um, the funding is reaching to, but there are other communities um, that Sarah can actually speak more because I don't know the other grants that well in that we are reaching in other parts of the states. We are, we are not saying in, in any way that refugees and immigrants are the only vulnerable population related to health disparities. However, um, COVID-19 has resurfaced uh, racial disparities across the nation and also in the state of Vermont. We have a very alarming uh, racial disparities. So, uh, for those of you who are following um, the, the data presented by the Department of Health, for children who tested possible, a positive under nine years old, almost 68%, almost 70% of children under nine years old who tested positive in the state of Vermont were racially diverse children, many of them from um, a refugee and immigrant communities. So that's a very alarming statistic for the second white state in the country. So when we look at allocating funding, funding should be allocated equitably to address the health disparities more imminent that are taking place, especially in a public health issue like COVID-19 right now. Right. Thank you. It's, it's very helpful to just be building more information, uh, which some of which we're complete, we're, we're aware of, but the more we hear it, the more we share it, the better. Um, I don't see any other hands raised at the moment, so I'm going to suggest perhaps, Sarah, that you continue and then we'll, uh, um, let me just check. I, Sarah, you're, are you, what is your availability to us this morning? I can be here the whole time. Okay, and Dr. Avila, are you available throughout as well? Uh, yes, I am, thank you. Okay, good, I just want, it occurred to me we should check. So this is, this is terrific to be able to, go back and forth and we, we will we will i assure you dr Beale, we will be turning to the task force recommendations as well uh even though we're spending uh, some so but let's move through the other the other recommendations uh, for grants that the department of health is currently doing and great. and and then uh, so. um wonderful and thanks for these great questions um i think it's it's helpful for me at least to be um, in dialogue with people about, you know, and decision makers about this um, to know what your questions are. So I can quickly run through the four other sub awards that are planned, um, tell you about the 
the target populations for that work and some of the activities um, that have been proposed to us. So as you know, Dr. Avila mentioned, we really did um, know that new Americans, refugee and immigrant communities were a priority for us to serve in a different and better way. Um, so the <clears throat> cultural broker work with um, Dr. Avila is kind of one part of the agreement, but Dr. Avila will also be um, training our staff in health equity, cultural and linguistic competence, um, implicit bias. We continue to welcome trainings like this for our workforce. Um, and she will also be doing um, focus groups, 10 focus groups um, to identify areas of need in different refugee populations, um, especially around messaging. And, and we'll report back to us um, her findings so that we can um, do a better job kind of streamlining communication to the, to the different folks we serve. Um, so that's Spectrum and Dr. Avila, and that's a big part of the work that I'm really excited about. Um, another population that has come to our attention as um, potentially not well served during COVID is migrant workers. Um, and so, and many of you may share the same concern. Um, we do have quite a significant number of um, migrant farm workers uh, in Vermont, mostly in Addison and Franklin counties, but spread, spread across the state. And as you can imagine, um, these folks are really at the intersection of a lot of kind of disadvantages and lack of access. Um, when we're talking about a trust relationship that doesn't exist um, for the most part with at least with state government. Um, it does exist with um, our hopeful subawardees, which are UVM extension bridges to health um, and open door clinic in Middlebury. And so these two agencies will be performing similar scopes of work, um, mostly outreach, education, um, and care management, similar to the cultural brokers. Um, their contracts, uh, at least the scopes, are written to be um, focused around messaging and creating culturally relevant messaging um, for folks who live and work on farms, um, and, and actual door-to-door -door visits or on worksite visits, um, to be more exact. Um, so these agencies have um, recommended hiring outreach, bilingual outreach staff to add to their teams, um, doing farm to farm visits with tangible things like they're, they're saying health kits. So COVID, COVID sanitation kits that include gloves, masks, sanitizer, um, and all the good information that um, we have on flyers and one pagers, but just aren't reaching um, these, these pretty isolated populations. Um, they're also going to be working on facilitating increased access to flu vaccines for the fall and just ensuring that um, migrant workers have primary care physicians, that they know where to access COVID-19 testing and care if needed, um, and that they will be that, that liaison kind of between the system and, and the community. Um, so that's that's that well, that chunk of it, and that's two different subawardees. Addison County is served by Open Door Clinic, where the majority of folks live, but UVM Extension Bridges to Health is statewide. Well, it's the other 13 counties, um, so they will have state statewide reach. Um, they have outreach workers in each county. Um, so I'll move on, unless you have questions there. To, um, well, why don't we go through them all and then we'll, we'll yeah. come back and maybe you can assign dollar amounts so because because okay. at some point one of the questions we're going to have is should we recommend any additional funding that might be used to supplement what's already being happening or not and it would give us a sense of proportion etc but why don't we go through it so the first one is the spectrum through spectrum youth and family services but more to the point about cultural brokers and what dr avila has been describing to us and That's then right. the second, a second is the open door clinic, and the third is bridges to health. Or are they? They're, so those are three, three different subgrants. Yeah. Yep. So that's three. Yeah, three subgrants. The fourth and fifth are to United Ways. Um, so the United Way of Wyndham County and the United Way of Rutland County. Um, obviously, we wanted to make sure that this funding would benefit um, as much as possible. Kind of the equitable distribution statewide. Um, and when we were reviewing um, the very clear subpopulations of that language in the bill, um, we really wanted to attend to um, racial and social justice. This is another kind of new, um, new flow of funding from the health department. Um, we recognize that you know, immigrant and new American refugee populations um, 
have specific barriers and that we have a lot of work to do to, to kind of reach them. Um, we also have a lot of you know, people of color in Vermont who are not refugee and immigrant um, who may also feel isolated and as Dr. Avila said, um, have really alarming disparities in rates of infection and death um, nationally and in Vermont. So um, what we did was a, a scan of kind of the racial and social justice advocacy organizations in the state. Um, we recognized a real pocket um, of activism and action in Wyndham County and approached uh, the United Way as a potential fiscal agent. Um, so again, this is, you know, the United Way kind of like spectrum is the, is the awardee, but then they plan to sub award to up to 14 different um, nonprofit agencies in their community um, that provide services such as um, Oh, excuse me, I had them written down here so I could tell you exactly. Mm -hmm. um, community and uh, social justice and equity, um, which is the priority. Also indigenous affairs, LGBTQ plus inclusion, rural health, um, and general wellness outreach. So they have those kind of categories of service um, and they are working with those organizations to um, determine kind of what programming they will roll out. All this funding needs to be spent, as you know, by the end of the calendar year, so they're um, implementation needs to happen immediately and, and they're prepared to do that. Um, the United Way of Rutland County, we, we know that you know Rutland County has um, its own specific kind of needs and um, gaps and services and that they also have a strong um, community building around racial and social justice. So in the same way, the United Way will, will act as the fiscal agent. Um, there were a couple of subpopulations named in the bill, um, older adults and um, disabled Vermonters that we found you know, we weren't actively targeting through these other awards. And so Rutland County is going to award to their um, Council on Aging um, and their uh, specifically a Meals on Wheels program. So I, to me, the Rutland County agreement is really um, tangible kind of delivery of meals, delivery of um, prevention education material um, for vulnerable and older adults. Um, I'll stop there. and. And see if there are any questions and I can definitely go back to any of this. So can I, and uh, so two things, one is that I think uh, Representative Rogers has very helpfully provided a copy of your report, the written report in the chat so that if anyone, as you say, Lucy, I, it's helpful for me sometimes to have a visual as well. I believe there's the report that shows where these grants are being awarded, but not with the detail I think that you're providing here today. Um, and uh, can you remind me, Sarah, I'm going to try to simultaneously pull up the report on my screen. Uh, yes, because I think I think part of what part of what left us with questions was the United Way. Uh, it listed United Way and broadly a general uh, sense, not with the specifics that you're just now talking about. Did When you were listing the specific groups or types of groups, were you talking about both Rutland and Wyndham County, or was that specifically to one of the counties? Um, I mentioned the Council on Age, or maybe I didn't, Council on Aging and Meals on Wheels. Those are specific to Rutland County. Mm -hmm. um, there are many um, that Wyndham County is hoping, hoping to partner with. I could give you some examples. I, I have a list of like 15 here, but they are organizations such as um, uh, the AIDS Project of Southern Vermont, Out in the Open, which is an LGBTQ plus advocacy organization. Right. Um, even, the, you know, like the Brooks Memorial Library, um, the Root Social Justice Center. It's, mm -hmm. they're, they're known entities that um, have been, I think partnered with the United Way for quite a while that are really hope, um, helping to move these justice efforts forward in their communities. Um, the Women's Freedom Center, and importantly, I want to note the um, Band of Elnu Abenaki uh, First Nations people that um, live in that area um, have, there, there's been a real gap in terms of, I can just speak for the health department, but I will assume also a lot of other um, departments uh, um, in reaching our First Nations um, community members. And so I'm really, it was really excited that they proposed, um, you know, they have a working relationship with um, with folks that um, are tribal, tribal leaders in that area. 
so those are just kind of a few examples of like the end users of the money and i'm happy to send you a memo later with um all of the proposed subawardees. that would actually be very helpful okay. i think uh, uh a, a memo that could be more specific yeah yep. so uh can i just i don't see any of the hands right now so that those are the grants that uh are currently being anticipated mm -hmm. through the um uh, five hundred thousand dollars of crf dollars is that is that correct sarah that's right yes and, and would it be fair to say that the the other health department grant the long acronym of which epidemiology and something and something yeah. uh grant those dollars are more internally focused those those they're they're for uh health disparities but are more internally focused for training within the health department workforce would that be fair to say is that well right? there's that piece but i also do want to say that part of the intent of that money is to sub award to community-based agencies in the same way that you see these kind of crf decisions being made um what was imagined was that um there would be up to eight um agencies statewide that we might be able to fund um in a similar way, I think, um, to the cultural brokers, but also our partnerships with the Association of Africans Living in Vermont and USCRI, um, those folks that um, can help us, you know, connect with disadvantaged community members, um, help us with language access issues, help us mm -hmm. with, um, you know, general healthcare access. So some of that money, I do think the plan is to, to sub award out. I don't know the exact amounts um but i know that written into there was uh written into the to the implementation. i think that's part of, that's part of what was suggested to us when we were when we initially had advocated for a million dollars and we're told that there was some dollars in this grant uh that would do some similar type yeah. work but but that work hasn't been articulated fully at this point it hasn't hasn't okay uh representative chris and then i i see a hand up so i'm going to turn to representative christensen and then um and then I think uh, I'm, I'm going to make a couple of comments that I think might help us. And then then I want to turn to Dr. Avila because I do want to hear the recommendations from the task force to get that on the table for us. Um, so Representative Christensen, and then uh, I'll make a couple of comments, and then we'll turn to Dr. Avila to hear from the task force recommendations. A quick question, and this is sort of the same as Representative Page's <laughs> um, comment. You said in answer to him that this money is spread throughout the state. But when I look at the list, it's sort of concentrated in certain areas. I'm from Windsor County. And you know, I see it in Wyndham County and I see it up in Addison County. Um, is that because the greatest need is there or are you targeting a, just a little yeah. bit further clarification? Good please. question. We didn't have time to do a formal needs assessment. What we did do um, was reach out to our district offices, so the local offices of local health in uh, all the regions of Vermont, um, to ask the district directors there and their staff um, what they saw as you know funding priorities around disadvantaged and underserved populations. Um, so that was a bit of an informal needs assessment to get back kind of ide either project ideas or names of organizations, whatever they saw as kind of the greatest need in their county. And so we used that as the basis of our um, kind of regional scan approach. We also did the um, our own research on the racial and social justice landscape in Vermont. And we did note that the majority of that work is happening in Chittenden County and Wyndham County. Um, Rutland does have a strong chapter of the NAACP, but we did see um, that capacity was was highest in those areas. Um, and I do think the, I understand the concern about statewide reach. Um, I think it's important to say that UVM Bridges to Health is a statewide program, um, and that although you know these subpopulations that we want to serve in a different way are pretty concentrated in Chittenden County, um, and then you know Wyndham and Addison County excuse me, sorry, Wyndham County, Addison and Franklin for the migrant workers, um, they will be offering services um, across the board. Um, so, so some of this work is definitely statewide and some of it is targeted to need and capacity of, of service organizations. Okay. One quick, one quick follow-up, I know we wanna move on, but is that because those areas, when you did your informal survey, maybe have more resources to be, um, activists or advocates for you know the population is that 
and other areas are just not as organized because they don't have the resources, either people-wise or money-wise? That's a really good question. I'm hesitant to to answer that, I, I because I don't want to say that the other regions are under resourced or you know less kind of um, less active in their communities. I will say that, um, yeah, from our assessment, what we noticed was there was greater capacity because of the number of organizations active in Windham and Chittenden counties, um, and just the um, knowledge of the need based on demographics. Um, but I. I'm not sure I can answer that fully. Um, I don't know I, because we didn't really have time to dig into the capacity um, of all, you know, all areas of Vermont um, in a way that we would want to. I think some of that is is unanswered. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I, okay. So I see two other hands have raised. I, I, I'm I I want to hear from members' questions, and I definitely we need to hear from Dr. Avila. So I. I'm trying to figure out how to balance that. Uh, could you, uh, Representative Rogers and Representative Smith, are your questions specific to the health department uh, or would they be appropriate to be held until we heard from Dr. Avila and then open it up for questions as broadly? I'm, I'm I can ask. wait, I can wait, Chair. Okay, I thank you, Brian. I can, does it work if I just name my question and I'm not yeah, sure when it- That'd be great, knows. name your question. Brian, if you want to name your question, but let's not take, let's not engage with the questions right now. That if you sure. if you each I, would do I that wait. and then okay lucy would you like to yeah, name I'm, i i just raised my hand because it it kind of came as a follow-up to and to representative christensen's questions but mm -hmm. i just at some point today i really feel that i need to understand more about the process of how the it was decided who the grants were awarded to mm -hmm. and just to understand more about what outreach took place and how the recipients were determined and I'm not sure where that fits in best, but that's something okay. that would be helpful so, to know more about. Okay, and uh, let me say before we before we turn to Dr. Vila, which I'd like to do in a moment, that I think as I'm listening, and this is from where I sit as the chair, from what we're sitting where I'm listening, I think we may have an opportunity here today to um, add to uh, the resources that are available and to supplement uh, at least what I'm hearing from the health department. And, and I wanna have that in, in our mind as we listen to Dr. Avila and the task force recommendations, because it may turn out that we have an unexpected opportunity here today uh, that uh, may be actually in everyone's interest. So Dr. Avila, let's turn to you. Thank you for your help in understanding this first part, but we'd like to hear from, the, from you and if you would frame what the task, I'll turn to you to let you frame what the task force charges, what the task force's charges are and uh, who the task force is and, and what the recommendations are. I'll turn it to you. Thank you. So I, I will start my, my formal introduction now uh, after Please. I talk about health disparities. I'm also switching hats, as you know, those of us that work in health equity, it's only a handful of us, so we're always yes in a million committees and in a million different initiatives across the state. But first I wanted to say thank you, Chair uh, Lippert and members of the Health Care Committee. And by the way, the, what you hear is the F-35s flying over me, but I have no control over them. <laughs> for giving me the opportunity to discuss briefly with you the recommendation related to health disparities as well as best practices to addressing and eliminating health disparities. My name is Maria Mercedes Avila. Most of you know me by Mercedes, which is my middle name. I'm a community representative member of the Governor's Racial Equity Task Force that was newly formed in June 2020. I'm also an associate professor of pediatrics and the Health Equity and Inclusive Excellence Liaison for the Larner College of Medicine at the University of Vermont. Today, I'm speaking as a health disparities and health equity expert and sharing evidence and research related to addressing health disparities. However, my views are not necessarily those of the University of Vermont. We have these disclaimers we had to share. Right. I mentioned already the statistics related to children under nine, that almost uh, those who tested positive for COVID-19, almost 70% of them were racially diverse. We also know that Black Vermonters have been affected by COVID-19 at particularly higher rates. 
Hispanic Vermonters have also contracted COVID-19 at higher rates compared to non-Hispanics. And also to, as all of you know, we live in the second whitest state in the country, making these statistics very alarming. We also know that in Chittenden County, for example, um, almost 3% of white people live in households with three or more generations compared to more than 11% of non-white families. So we know that when we have a pandemic or an outbreak like the one that happened in Winooski and in Burlington here in our area in Chittenden County, we find that multi-generational housing can affect isolation and quarantine. And those were two key aspects of um, that connecting you know, to the outbreak in this area. The recommendations I'm gonna share related to health disparities were drafted by the Racial Equity Task Force and informed by its 12 members. The, the Racial Equity Task Force is conformed by 12 members, but we also had more than 24 groups and organizations that provided advice and consultation during the development of these recommendations. Specific to COVID-19 and health disparities, the Racial Equity Task Force drafted 14 recommendations divided into four categories, language access, access to testing, data collection and reporting, and economic fallout. As many of you know, the report was submitted to the governor yesterday. Um, so he, we wanted the governor to have an opportunity to review the report before making the report public and these recommendations. Related to language access, more than 9,000 Vermonters are limited English proficient in the state. During the earliest weeks of COVID-19, limited English proficient populations did not have access to real-time information. Community organizations and members got together to support these refugee and immigrant communities by translating and creating videos in the 10 most commonly spoken languages in Vermont. Eventually, these initiatives received stable funding. However, that did not happen until later on in the spring, almost May 2020. Within language access, the recommendations include mandating that all communications, including educational materials related to COVID-19 response, be translated into Vermont's most commonly spoken languages. Ensuring that all COVID-19 related grants include line items for translation and interpretation services as required by federal and state laws. And also in this section, requiring or working towards having every state agency contracting with and collaborating with refugee and immigrant service providing organizations to ensure that interpretation and translation services are culturally responsive and appropriate as that's the area of expertise for the organizations that serve refugees um, and work with them on the ground every day. The next area is access to testing. Lack of access to testing for communities of color happened across the state. Another barrier was transportation. Transportation has proven to be a challenge during summer and spring months, and this barrier will worsen as inclement weather approaches. Within access to testing, there are several recommendations. Support and increase infrastructure for homeless Vermonters impacted by COVID-19. Ensure that testing accessibility by collaborating with community organizations that serve marginalized groups and conduct broader testing in prisons in state and out of state where we know a disproportionately high number of people of color are testing positive. The next area is data collection and reporting. Overall, the task force recommends investing in data collection and reporting systems to ensure race and ethnicity data is as effectively tracked across the state. This will allow us to identify racial and health disparities and assess risks, for example, for COVID-19 in communities of color. We acknowledge as a racial equity task force and in my personal um, um, view as a health equity uh, scholar that collecting race data can pose additional concerns related to distrust with healthcare organizations 
due to the horrific historical events, like I mentioned earlier, unethical medical research, the eugenics movement in Vermont and other um, events. Within this recommendation, um, one of the recommendations is to increase resources in COVID-19 test results to ensure that race and ethnicity data collection and analysis are happening effectively. Collaborate with community and health organizations to provide training and education on cultural humility for health service providers that administer COVID-19 tests at testing sites and in healthcare organizations. Finally, the last and fourth section of recommendations is called um, economic fallout. As you know, many Vermonters have experienced tremendous job losses and job interruptions due to COVID-19. Several COVID-19 related funding sources became available to communities. However, not all communities were included in this area or in the relief funding that was available to communities. For example, migrant farm working populations. The main recommendation in this area is to create a state level relief fund, similarly to the one successfully implemented in the state of California, to provide economic relief to those who, because of their immigration status could not access relief funds. Even though migrant working populations are also Vermont essential workers in our economies, they are most often excluded and forgotten. Health disparities do not happen in isolation. They happen with intersecting problems in our society. The Racial Equity Task Force recommendations expand into other intersecting areas like schools, housing, technology accessibility, workplace and government operations. Most importantly, we need to remember that health disparities are defined as unnecessary, unavoidable, unfair, and unjust. Health disparities are preventable, and they represent injustices that continue to affect historically disadvantaged groups in our society. The Racial Equity Task Force recommendations I just shared align with national best practice models for addressing and eliminating health disparities. In sum, we need to actively work to address poverty and improve health, housing, and employment. We need to proactively ensure a health equity and justice approach in which all communities have access to quality health care and a fair chance to be as healthy as possible in our society. We need to allocate funding equitably while ensuring our most vulnerable communities have a fair access to opportunities and funding sources we need state and local leadership committing, committed to dismantling systemic racism and other forms of oppression. This is not a one political party issue. This is not a one leader's responsibility, but a social and public health policy issue affecting everyone in our state. We are all responsible to address these issues. We need to ensure our representatives, our workforce, our leaders, reflect the community that we serve. We need to ensure everyone, including our healthcare workforce, understands the root causes of health disparities, the history of this country, and the responsibility that we all have to dismantle systemic racism. We need to work with communities, hear our voices, and advocate for historically disadvantaged groups. Thank you again, and I know this is a lot of information, uh, but I welcome any questions you may have, and I'm here for as long as you need me to answer those questions. Great. Um, thank you for so clearly articulating the recommendations uh, from the task force. And if, am I, would I be correct in understanding that there is a written report that would now, since it has been presented to the governor, which now would become available uh, broadly there is a 20 page uh, a report, yes, that was submitted to the governor yesterday. Yesterday, yes. Okay, so I would ask that that report be posted on our House Healthcare website. And uh, Demis, who is our committee, uh, who's the assistant to our committee, uh, if you would secure that link and uh, provide it to all the members of the committee, as well as posting it on our website, just so we have easy access to it. Okay, uh, 
Well, good. Uh, let let me. Uh, so let me let me take a minute and say and so I think it's very helpful to have uh, the health department's report in front of us. It's very helpful to hear the task force recommendations, which are from the uh, governor's racial equity task force. Uh, there's an overlap. It's not they're not the same. Uh, and there's, there's the racial equities task force has a broader mandate, but it also has a uh, intersection around COVID-19 recommendations as well. Um, I think what I'd like to do, so so before I before I open it up for questions, I'm going to suggest that what we have in front of us today is, as I said at the outset, <clears throat> excuse me, what we have in front of us today is a an opportunity to get an update on where the CRF dollars uh, are being allocated around health disparities, including racial health disparities, but not exclusively to that. Um, and, we, and we should remember that CRF dollars are unique. I mean, it's a unique opportunity uh, for yeah. Vermont, uh, but they, they come with certain restrictions. Uh, they, they, CRF dollars must be allocated and spent before December 30th, at least at this point, unless the federal government makes some change, which they haven't to this point, but they must be allocated and spent before December 30th. Uh, and they must have a nexus uh, to COVID-19 uh, issues uh, specifically, but nevertheless, they provide an opportunity to uh, move some uh, to, to assist communities specifically around COVID-19 issues, uh, impacted communities, uh, disproportionately impacted communities. So that's the first piece. The second piece is that I would like to just say as the chair of this committee, at least the chair for now, uh, I have a, and I, and I think this is shared by many members, if not all members of our, com our committee actually, uh, an interest and an ongoing interest around health disparities issues that will go beyond December 30th. And that definitely go beyond December 30th. And, but that today what we can, but that we will, we will continue to visit this issue and revisit it as part of our commitment uh, as the healthcare committee to eliminate health disparities in Vermont. But what we have today is particularly to focus on the CRF uh, opportunities that are in front of us. So with that, I'd like to open up the questioning from committee members and then uh, think together about how, and maybe we'll along the way, I'll lay out some more information and we'll think about how we can proceed. So I know that Lucy had put a question on the table, Brian has a question and I see Representative Donahue has a question. Uh, it's so, actually just a, a heads up that I, I sent everyone I emailed everyone a copy. Again, thanks, Lucy, for the concept of having it in front of us. I, I emailed a copy of our, our the language that we from our committee put in the bill last June. So it should be in your inbox to, to have it in front of you if you want. OK, uh, thank you. And does Demis have that? Is that accessible to Demis to share I, if that was useful? I sent it on the House Health Care yeah. uh, she email, does so I think that get, Den Demis gets that, yeah. So Demis, I don't know, I'm, let's do a little administrative piece here quickly. Uh, Demis, if that's, I don't, I don't know how easy or difficult it is to actually grab a document like that, that possibly could be shared on the screen at some point if we find that useful. But if you could be looking at that while we hear questions, it, that would be great. Okay, uh, so I'm going to turn back to the questions that had been raised, the hands that had been raised earlier, first from Representative Rogers and then Representative Smith. So uh, Representative Rogers, do you want to articulate your question again so that uh, we understand it? Uh, well, well, actually, before we do that, because that was specific to, I think, the health department, I want to see if there are questions for Dr. Avila uh, based on the presentation that she just made in terms of the uh, Governor's Racial Equity Task Force. I do have the Okay, Representative Smith. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for uh, all of your testimony this morning. Appreciate it. I have a question uh, involving 
the, the number of COVID cases in Chittenden County, I, I believe it numbers somewhere seven or 800 right now, I'm not sure, but could, do you have an idea of what the percentage of that amount of cases in Chittenden County are of uh, minority members? I don't have the, the statistics right at hand. If that, that's probably more a question for the Department of Health. However, um, we know that um, African Americans in Vermont were 11%, um, had an 11% higher chance of um, testing positive uh, or being infected by COVID-19. That's one of the statistics that was shared uh, recently on a VPR. There were two segments specifically about racial disparities and, and COVID-19, but there are some um, reports uh, and graphs available through the Department of Health, specifically looking at um, racial disparities. I don't know if Sarah, you know uh, more of these yeah. I'm trying to pull it up right now for you and I, I'm not finding it. I can certainly insert it into the memo that I send um, later today. I uh, want to point out too that we're saying, you know, Vermonters of color are much more likely um, to be at higher risk for COVID. And the, the percentage of people of color in Vermont is very small. So I think it's less than one and a half percent. So that's the disparity is when we see, you know, that it's not equal, that the rate of infection and death is not equal um, as a percentage of the population. So that's what's most concerning. And I will, um, I'm on our website right now, so I'll see if I can find what you're looking for. I think my next question could be answered by either one of you. Uh, I believe uh, when we ask for, or when a group asks for an additional appropriation of either a, a million or two million or whatever, the money that's appropriated for everyone, doesn't a minority have the opportunity to go in to the hospital as equally as anyone else in the state does? Or why, why do we need to spend additional money when everybody is supposed to be equally treated. Perhaps I could intervene here and make a comment. Um, yeah, and I'll let others respond as well. But I think, Brian, we, we've talked about this before uh, in, in our committee that when we uh, understand that there are uniquely highly impacted communities, as we discussed around suicide prevention, if you recall, uh, and we talked, and I think you raised a similar question then. And I, I shared the example, which, uh, and at the time, I think it had to do with LGBTQ youth who are, uh, we know, at very high risk uh, for uh, self-harm, including suicide thoughts, suicidal attempts, et cetera. And I, and I suggested that we also remember that other groups are at high risk, such as veterans, uh, as an example. And so that we need to do, uh, so that while, quote, everybody has the chance to go to the hospital, together at the same time, there are often unique barriers to subgroups of Vermonters, even if it's a small subgroup, that um, and particularly when we find that they're disproportionately impacted. And I, so I, I just want to just, on behalf of our witnesses, acknowledge that we've had some conversation about this in our committee and that it's, it's, uh, it's important to understand that allocating additional dollars is one way for the state of Vermont to uh, address these disproportionate impacts. But I'll, I will let others comment as well. Okay, thank you. And I would be happy to, to also share a couple of pieces related to, to health disparities. One of them I mentioned earlier, uh, the history of, there is a history of distrust from historically underserved communities with the healthcare system and anything that has to do with scientific research. And that the history of that has to do with in Vermont, specifically the yeah. eugenic movement that led to forced sterilizations of community members that to this date, that distrust continues to happen. And we define that as historical trauma that has passed down through generations, not being able to trust a, a provider, the system. I've also heard from um, uh, community members, especially native people, that um, sometimes they they check a box, they go to see a doctor, for example, they check a box saying that they are native, and the healthcare provider questions 
whether they are native or not, because they look white, because many of our Abenaki native people in the state look a specific way. So that distrust of having to explain your heritage, you're trying to regain and reclaim your, your own identity and that is questioned on a regular basis in a daily life that also connects to historical trauma. The other important piece about um, access in healthcare is that healthcare, even though um, is available, not everybody has access to health insurance. Not everybody has access to health literacy information. And this applies not only to refugees and immigrants, but low socioeconomic status communities in Vermont, people living in rural areas. Right now, COVID-19 is a perfect example of the health disparities that exist. We're moving, for example, into telemedicine and telehealth models that in some areas, patients don't have access to Wi-Fi. They don't have access to a laptop to be able to connect with. And even um, one population, as you know, that is mostly affected by COVID-19 is the elderly population. The technology used for telehealth and telemedicine was not created with elderly populations in mind. So we can have a telehealth appointment, and I know because my mother is here, and they send emails with all the instructions, and if they, she doesn't have two or, two or three of us explaining how to log in into Zoom, how to sign a consent. There are all these barriers that are presented for whether you are a specific age group or a specific cultural group. And the other important piece about health disparities is that we have many populations in Vermont that are defined as limited English proficient, and limited English proficiency means that some communities don't speak English as a first language, but limited English proficiency also includes communities that have a disability, communities that need ASL interpretation, and also communities that were born in the United States. They are native English speakers and they cannot read or write in English fluently, which is a percentage of our population in Vermont. So when we look at accessing healthcare, there are many barriers. Transportation is one of them taking time off from work to be able to get to an appointment, being able to understand what the provider is saying to us in a medical appointment. And then when somebody doesn't speak English as a first language, there is that additional level of complexity of having to use an interpreter, an iPad, a telephonic um, piece that also poses other, um, other areas. All those pieces are connected to health disparities and inequities. So we, can, it might even get to a hospital, but that doesn't mean that we are going to understand what's happening in a medical interaction. There is a great resource available online by the US Department of Health and Human Services. They explained that every time we go to see a doctor, a mental health clinician, any type of health or healthcare appointment, those appointments generally take 15 to 20 minutes. When a patient leaves the room, they only remember from that interaction 20% of what happened there. So imagine if we add language limitations, health literacy issues, patients don't remember anything of what we say in those interactions. So we need to be investing in expanding time for appointments, expanding resources to be able to ensure that communities understand what's happening with their health and healthcare. So those are some issues related to effective communication and, and health literacy that are directly linked to ensuring that we address and eliminate health disparities. Thank you. Thank you, that's very helpful uh, to have you uh, articulate that more clearly. Thank you. Um, I, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm managing our, uh, we, we have, so I, I'm not, you know, actually, <laughs> I'm not clear who sees our chat uh, notes or if it's just uh, members who are on the Zoom call, I think, but I will just bring to our attention that, and uh, Representative Donahue, you, you added something to the chat, and I'm gonna ask you to maybe just comment rather, so that everyone hears it, and then we'll turn to Representative Page and Representative Cordes for their questions as well, because I think your comment is timely in terms of Dr. Avila's comments about historic uh, lack of trust with the healthcare system. Thanks, yes, I, I was just uh, completely agreeing with those comments about um, you know, historic um, uh, trust issues based on, on trauma and a lot of times systemic um, oppression, uh, racism and discrimination and saying, um, 
that there isn't the, the added language barrier, but those issues you brought up are very similar for um, members of the LBGTQ community and psychiatric survivors who have that same um, real difficulty accessing uh, health care um, because of, of fears from past discrimination. So um, I think it, it, there were excellent points and that that's part of why we identified those groups as well among our um, COVID-19 uh, disparity, you know, ac access to support, housing, food. Um, I think your point about accompanying to uh, doctors, offices and so forth is an excellent additional area. Uh, and I, I would just add that uh, for some communities, LGBTQ communities, in fact, uh, just actually sharing that information, sharing that identity mm -hmm. is often a question of whether is it is this a safe space in which to even when I try to seek health care, uh, when I if I as a gay man or a lesbian woman or someone with another sexual identity uh, will how will I be received uh, and will I in fact get uh, impartial or appropriate treatment. Uh, so there's there's a lot there's all these are these are again right. examples of barriers and I I, I, and, I would re ask Representative Donahue to comment but I'm I'm guessing the same would be true for many psychiatric survivors as well. Well, particularly in that I mean they each have their each group has their own but psychiatric survivors it's the the huge issue of um, now I'm forgetting the medical term but um, you know uh, uh, health concerns being totally dismissed based on the moment somebody knows you have a psychiatric history, mm -hmm. everything gets interpreted that in that lens and there's often lens. misdiagnoses as a result. So there's a lot of fear and trust around uh, sharing that. Right. And I wanted to add briefly, so I'm an educator. So uh, what I teach my students, especially health and sciences students and medical students, is that we need to move away from blaming the victims for their conditions, for their positions in society, for not accessing healthcare, from not getting to an appointment, but we need to look at the social and environmental conditions, the structural conditions that are preventing groups from moving forward and being able to thrive in our society. So I think it's moving away, have that critical thinking lens to be able to see if a specific communities are disproportionately being affected by COVID-19, if we have higher suicide rates in the LGBTQ community, if we have um, higher mental health issues and substance abuse issues in a specific community, it's not because people are choosing those specific conditions, but there are social and environmental conditions that are leading communities to those areas. And our responsibility, um, a health equity scholar, you as legislators, our responsibility is to address those social, social determinants of health are defined by Healthy People 2020. We need to understand those five areas of social determinants of health and improve those five areas, which is housing, employment, education, access to healthcare, exposure to discrimination, neighborhood and built environment. Once we improve those five areas, health outcomes improve by themselves. So our responsibility is to focus on improving social and environmental conditions, structural conditions that are preventing groups from thriving in our communities and moving away from blaming the victims because that hasn't worked in our society and actually continues to perpetuate some of the systemic oppression that happens to this date. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to turn to Representative Page. You have, is your hand still up or is that from previously or you have it up again? Because if you do, that's fine. I have it up again. Okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, let's hear your question then from Representative Cordes. It's, it's um, well, I guess it's, it's more of a comment uh, for Ms. Chesborough as well as Dr. Anna, as well as um, it has to do with the grant, grants, and it also has to do with your recommendations. And I know up here in Orleans, and Essex, and other counties, uh, to include uh, Representative Christensen's county, um, COVID-19 is, um, is I, w I wouldn't say it's non-existent, but it's it's the numbers are very low, okay? And I think we were getting to this earlier with uh, Representative Lip Lippert's comments as well. We wanna keep those numbers low, whether it be in the Orleans County or, or Essex or in 
Chittenden County. I would like to see those grant monies, you know, properly distributed, you know, because we do have an immigrant community up here that does farm, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to see those grant monies properly and properly distributed amongst all of our, our um, all of our Vermonters. And in addition, uh, Dr. Avila, your recommendations, I'd like to see those also um, properly uh, distributed and educated, um, not just in, you know, Chittenden County area throughout Vermont. And um, those are my comments for the tour. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Representative Page. Uh, let's hear from, Rep I see Representative Cordes, you have your hand up, and then I think Representative Rogers had a question that uh, we'll return to. And then after that, I think I'm going to see if we can shift our conversation to a recommendation that we can perhaps all uh, think together about. So Representative Cordes and then Representative Rogers. Thank you, Chair. And again, thank you. Dr. Avila, and I, I want to clarify, I believe your last name is pronounced Avila, not Avila. It is Avila, yes, like the Spanish city or the Catholic saint. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I want to amplify what Dr. Avila was saying about we, we especially as the most of us in our committee, not all of us, are um, members of um, the white part of our white dominant culture. And as such, if we have not taken the time to listen to what black indigenous and people of color have been telling us for generations and generations and generations, then we're gonna keep asking those questions about, um, you know, is this really happening? Um, and there's so much data out there you could you could drown in it so when uh, witnesses like dr avila come to us to share her incredible expertise but also as someone who has lived experience in that community um, i i implore us to do um, a good job of of listening and um, as a healthcare worker on the front lines I can say that on a regular basis, the people in the Black, Indigenous, and um, people of color community are treated differently and inequitably. Um, and there are very good reasons why many will not go to the emergency department. And this includes um, people that need psychiatric assistance. Um, it's because of their, and LGBTQ people, it's because of their direct experience with the healthcare system, which um, continues to um, systematically support white at the detriment of everyone else. So I could throw more st statistics at you, like um, the black white disparity for inf infant mortality exists at all educational level. Um, so even, um, people with a master's degree higher, the infant mortality rate for uh, Black women is the highest if they have a, a doctorate or a professional degree. So it doesn't matter what your, um, it, it then does not matter what your economic status is either. Um, and a topic of research um, and our, our horrible history of um, imposing unjust, unethical, horrific research on non-white individuals, um, even when best intended research is performed, um, it neglects to fully understand, for example, example how heart disease manifests and uh, shows itself in women how heart disease manifests and shows itself in black individuals. Um, so the research is done primarily on, or getting better, but a lot of the research by which treatments are then, um, and plans of care 
are derived from are based on populations that don't look anything like or have um, any um, connection to a large segment of our, our community. So I'm imploring us, calling us all in um, to, do, to do better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cordes. So I'm going to turn to Representative Rogers' question and uh, and then I then, as I said, I think I want to kind of bring this together uh, toward a discussion of uh, moving forward because I think there is an opportunity in front of us as a committee to make a recommendation, perhaps to add additional uh, resources, at least within the CRF uh, framework that we have available to us. Uh, at this time. So Lucy, if, do you want to re restate your question? And, yeah, and I, I actually see... have a few questions, Chair Lippert, okay. that are specific. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's hear them and uh, let's go through them. And, um, uh, <laughs> and the first one is the one that I asked earlier, which is just to help me understand more, you know, was there a public RFP process that was put out? How were the organizations and the recipients of this money identified what did that process look like and how were the um, amounts of the awards determined? Sorry, I had trouble unmuting, but I can definitely speak to that. Um, Representative Rogers, I want to acknowledge too that you did send some questions up through our commissioner's office around this that I don't think came back to you yet. And that was in mid-August. Well, yeah, awesome. I'm glad. Thank you for bringing it back up. Um, so there was not a public RFP process for this. We determined that we didn't have the time. I think, you know, these awards were made available, gosh, maybe late June, early July. And just knowing that that spending time frame was so quick, um, we didn't think we had um, the time to ask for proposals. And so we did submit um, to the Agency of Administration the questionnaire that kind of, you know, asked those questions about how we will be assessing need and um, and we were clear that we weren't um, going to be able to open it up for um, for applications. And then, um, you know, our we were wanting to be very attentive to the regional spread um, of the money, and so that's kind of um, where we did our informal assessment within our um, offices of local health. Um, so that looked like a, a survey um, to the division, excuse me, the district directors um, at the offices of local health, and an ask for them to. Um, collaborate with their staff and community partners and reply to us with kind of their opinions of um, best, best ways to spend this money regionally. Um, our highest funding priority, as you've heard through, through all of this, was um, refugees and immigrants um, followed by migrant workers. And so the populations of those populations, um, excuse me, the, the percentages of those populations are very high in Chittenden County, um, hence the the award to Spectrum um, and the awards to UVM and Open Door Clinic. Um, we also have been following, obviously, the state and national disparities, racial disparities um, with COVID-19. And so we really wanted to, we really understood the importance of um, this funding reaching Vermonters of color um, and Vermonters with limited English proficiency beyond um, refugee and immigrant populations, which is why we went, why we performed the scan of um, racial and social justice organizations regional, excuse me, statewide. Um, and our outreach to the United Way was an idea that um, instead of funding individual nonprofits and breaking this <laughs> award up into many small awards, which would be kind of administratively burdensome, I think, on the receiving end, that we could find a regional fiscal agent. Um, and so, so we opened up those conversations with United Ways. And as you know, that that's one of the roles that they serve best, I think. They already have the funding relationships with their partners. Um, we uh, did have a collaborative decision-making process that actually included um, Susanna Davis and the Racial Equity Task Force. Um, in July, we met with, with Susanna several times to um, have her kind of vet our initial thinking um, and to give us some guidance on um, underserved populations that perhaps we hadn't thought of. So we, we did get um, you know, an informal endorsement, um, I think from, from Ms. Davis um, to proceed with these subpopulations that we had identified. Um, 
we included lots of decision makers at the health department too. Um, it was a very collaborative decision making process. Um, I will say um, that one of the items in the bill that, that stood out to me um, was the, um, the, the fact that our sub awardees should be chosen based on um, previous performance, prior demonstrated work with affected populations um, and or that they were members of affected populations. So we really kept that as a high priority as we were looking for agencies to fund. The outreach was cold, um, which was a little bit strange. It was a different um, process than we have that we normally take with grants um, that we really kind of did some, um, some calls uh, and introduced the idea and the opportunities. Um, and engaged the responses we got back. So um, I think we did as best we could in the limited time frame to assess statewide need um, and really kind of went where the where we knew the populations were. Okay. I hope that answers. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. I think um, with full understanding of the incredible time pressure the department was under, I think a question I'm left with is just um, since this whole conversation is framed about populations that may not in the past have had the strongest connections with public health and 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 departments within the administration. I'm kind of left curious if an organization that did not already have a strong connection with a with a regional health um, mm -hmm. office would have a chance to have known that this money existed or to have reached out and you know mm -hmm. to have known it existed enough to reach out and suggest that they might be a good recipient and that's kind of the question I'm left with, with, with an understanding of the pressures that the department was under. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I could give you an example of how that worked in Wyndham County, which was that um, the United Way did a pretty broad reach out to their partners. And I can inquire about kind of how broad that was, but sounded like they, um, you know, they, they did reach out to the smaller organizations like, you know, out in the mount, out in the open, um, or, you know, some other really small advocacy organizations that aren't usually direct um, subrecipients of the health department. Um, you know, there's kind of all those middle layers um, to engage them in conversation about whether they could use this funding. So I do think at least, you know, as an example in Wyndham County, that local outreach happened and, and it did happen to, uh, it did happen with organizations that aren't, um, you know, kind of traditionally funded or are smaller and less visible. So I'm, gonna suggest, I'm gonna suggest that we keep moving on because I because what we have is in front of us is possibly an opportunity to add to uh, outreach and uh, so it's helpful to understand what has happened or what hasn't happened. But uh, Lucy, you had some other questions, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah. I was wondering. I know in the language that we passed, we you know the needs were specific to COVID, but not specific to healthcare, specific to. Um, issues that could include food or housing or um, kind of emotional support that that may be heightened because of COVID. So I'm curious if there's examples of ways that the money is being used beyond um, public health information. Yes, absolutely. And I want to say I really loved the inclusion of um, the provision of emotional support. That was such like unique and creative language to see um, in a bill. And so, yes, we were able to um, take advantage of that kind of direct aid, you know, that tangible piece that we understood from the language. Um, there are examples in, um, I will say, you know, the, the Rutland County proposal to bolster their Meals on Wheels program seems very tangible that we know there are folks who are isolated in their homes that are older with disabilities who um, you know, lack access to um, nutritional meals. And so actually that delivery and that, I think there's emotional support there. Oftentimes those folks, those volunteers um, are doing more than just dropping off a meal. Um, so anecdotally, we know that, that that really helps build relationships and trust in um, the healthcare system. There, um, so, you know, there were, there were other streams of the CRF money that we knew were going directly to um, housing, for instance. There was a lot of, um, you know, other departments and agencies were getting money to support homelessness prevention um, and, you know, rehousing. So we did not see that as our priority. Um, we, knew, we knew that that was kind of being covered by other funds. Um, and similarly, I think there were some, a lot of funds supporting food access. Um, but we really, um, 
we really love the language around kind of safely meeting your essential needs. Um, so one other example from, from Wyndham County, um, I believe it's through their library, um, they're offering like an outdoor distanced yoga for older adults. And this is like a chance for people to come um, connect with people they trust, you know, potentially get some care management, um, but meet their emotional needs through stress relief and, um, you know, enjoying being in a community together. So those are just a couple of examples, but I did really appreciate that, the allowance of those services through the bill language. I can ask one more question and then okay. be done. Um, I, I, I noticed in the report that our committee, report back that our committee received from the Department of Health that there was a list of priority um, health disparity groups going forward that the department was looking at. And I noticed the list was somewhat different than the list that we had provided in the bill. And I know we didn't have the most thorough process ever, but we did use past work from the department um, with health disparities to uh, as part of our process of, in, of the groups that we included. So I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit why the shift and, and where, where the group, um, where the list that you came up with came from, and then specifically if there was an intentional reason for the exclusion of anybody from the LGBTQ population or if that was an mm -hmm. oversight. It was an oversight in that report to you for sure. Um, LGBTQ plus communities are a priority population for us. They're named in our state health improvement program um, or plan, excuse me. Um, and we've done a lot of work with um, advocacy organizations. One of the ultimate subrecipients of this money um, out in the mountains in Wyndham County only serves LGBTQ plus folks. Um, and as well, there are some other kind of supporting organizations in Wyndham County. So I do feel like at least in that region, money is flowing directly to you know an end user who is um, of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so the, the, you know, the qualitative analysis that we undertook really identified, you know, as I said, re refugees, immigrants, migrant workers, and Vermonters of color um, as the highest priority for kind of for the health messaging. Um, we do know that LGBTQ plus people experience health disparities um, at, at a high rate and have particular vulnerabilities to infection with COVID-19. Um, those are things like you know, smoking tobacco at a higher rate um, than heterosexual cisgender peers, um, higher rates of HIV and cancer. So there, um, I'm glad you called that out and uh, we will absolutely include um, LGBTQ plus individuals in our priority population list moving forward. Yeah, that's helpful. I guess if in one sentence, if you could just be a little bit more specific about when you said your outreach identified that, I guess what I'm trying to understand is what that outreach looked like. Uh, it was, um, you know, there was a lot of listening involved. I don't know if I can sum this up in one sentence. I'm sorry. There, we were really trying to be responsive to the need that to the needs that were expressed to us, um, and those were by the regional health. Off, I just like needs that were expressed by by community members, really, by people who felt um, uh, uh, not served well, um, and that that a lot of that happened in the context of the Winooski Burlington outbreak. Um, so whether it was individual people coming forward to say, you know, I didn't feel like I had access to this service or it was advocates or cultural brokers coming to us to say, you know, look, the same language access pieces needs to be quicker. Um, we were, we were really just trying to be responsive to those needs and to um, in, try to be quick in immediately funding um, those needs. So um, and the, yeah, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but the, the outreach that we did, um, really kind of aligned with those populations because we were in such a time crunch. Um, so yeah, thank you. So we, time crunch seems to be the, unfortunately the issue that's in front of us over and over, both as legislators, as well as those who are trying to implement what we um, put forward. Um, I'm. I'm just going to I'm going to suggest that in the light of what um, we've we've gotten a lot more information here today, and it's actually I think it's been very helpful uh, both from uh, the health department and from the task force recommendations, and uh, in anticipation of that, and combined with what I explained to our committee members, but I'll explain to our witnesses as well, that the speaker of the house had said to each of the chairs of committees. 
who were reviewing the implementation of CRF dollars, again, that need to be used by December 30th but, and COVID related, asked each of our committees to think about whether any additional recommendations should be brought forward for further allocation of CRF dollars in particular areas. Mm -hmm. I, uh, in uh, full confession, in reaching out to myself and the leadership of the committee, but not to the full committee, uh, identified health disparities uh, based on our previous work. And based on what we understood at the time, were some of the areas that had been addressed with the health department, but some of the areas that perhaps that were not being addressed uh, in the same manner, uh, some of which we had identified. I, would, I should note uh, that there were two separate grants given CRF dollars uh, to Africans living in Vermont, specifically uh, through, the, through the work that we did jointly with the health with the Human Services Committee, and I believe they received a grant of three hundred thousand or three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and also a specific grant to the Refugee Resettlement Project, which also received a specific outreach grant. So that that should be brought at least into the context of what we're talking about here today. Uh, me turn off my phone, um, but um, but in the interest of trying to respond and take advantage of opportunity that was perhaps presented to us. Uh, I had asked uh, for some language to be drafted that might uh, allow us to allocate some additional dollars, uh, a CRF dollars, uh, perhaps uh, to the health department for further allocation. Uh, through, uh, and, and one of the questions might be, well, what would the process be? Is that possible? Uh, and Dr. Avila, uh, in taking into account some of the recommendations that we've heard today, whether there are recommendations that can be incorporated into the time frame of between now and December 30th. Uh, so I would, and given your close relation, working relationship with the Department of Health, uh, I would personally think that there would be close collaboration if we are able to allocate any additional dollars. So I want to just open it. I, I guess I'm. I guess I'm going to dive right in and say, I would like to put on the table that we recommend some additional CRF dollars be allocated uh, in addition to what has already been allocated and that we uh, review some language that has been prepared that would at least uh, begin to articulate some of that uh, and then try to identify uh, that so that we're in a position to see if we see if the committee can come to a recommendation uh, today uh, to give to our appropriations committee. So I'm going to turn, so I, for first, how to proceed. Um, <laughs> let me take a breath here for a moment. Uh, I guess I'm trying to I'm trying to think what what's the best way to proceed. I I, I think I put on the table that, that that we make a recommendation for some additional dollars. I'd like to maybe start with that and and just test that with our committee members, uh, and then also um, uh, then we'll circle around to our witnesses and see if they feel like they if some additional dollars were allocated if they could in fact. Uh, take those dollars and move them out in a timely manner, uh, which I would hope that would be the case if we recommend it. But Ann Donahue, did you, do you want to dive in here? I, I, you actually ended up referencing it. I just wanted to, you know, I'm sure the legislature threw a lot of overlapping stuff out, but in terms of it, it was, there was specific additional money specifically for Meals on Wheels around the state. Um, and it was 700,000 that went to new Americans, um, refugees and immigrants for language outreach and all of those things. So I, I think we should, I, I agree about um, trying to um, target some additional funds. I think we may want to target them looking specifically to uh, groups that didn't um, maybe get a focus in the, in the first round and also that um, 
the focus on the things we were targeting that were not eligible under the um, ELC, which was for language and so forth, uh, but more some of the other things. So, um, but mostly I wanted to comment on, and, and I think that's when as leadership, we got together, we were trying to look, some of the feedback has been terrific in terms of what we were trying to look at as potential language. Which I'm maybe just, you wanted. That's where I'm just going to suggest that we put we put in front of the committee the language, some some specific language that's been drafted that is open to modification. And this is and uh, and I don't because I think it'll answer some of what's been discussed and will be a good frame for carrying the discussion on. Right. I, do, I we have, do we have that language available to put on the screen? Do you want me to put up? I mean, I can share my screen if I have permission, if you want. Oh, yes, Jennifer, Jen, not Jennifer, Jen. Yes, that would be great. If you, I don't know how, who has to give you authorization to share a screen or how that works. Demis does, and she just did it, so I should okay. be good. Okay. All right. Can you now see my screen? We can. Great. We can. Thank you. Um, sure. And um, we're going to need to depend on you to um, continue to scroll for us. But if you could scroll up, I think, a little bit. Um, and Keep going. Uh, uh, yes, and I think what, what, what we'll find here is that some of this language is similar to what we had put together as a committee initially. Uh, but then there's some further, further language. Uh, do you want to walk us through this, Jen, just briefly? But. Sure. Yes. So Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council, for the record. This would appropriate a to be determined sum from CRF dollars to the health department as a supplement to the monies that were appropriated in the bill that we had worked on a couple of months ago. It would direct the department to use the funds for grants to community organizations, and there's more coming in that on, uh, on that in subsection B to conduct outreach to isolated individuals at high risk of adverse outcomes. This uses the same language we had used in Act 136. Um, high risk of adverse outcomes from the COVID-19 pandemic based on factors such as race or ethnicity, immigrant status, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, age, and geographic location in order to assess and identify their needs during the COVID-19 public health and emergency and to identify and address their difficulties in safely meeting essential needs, including food, shelter, healthcare, and emotional support during the public health emergency to help protect themselves and others from the disease. So that's kind of the intro part. And then it has the department determine the community organizations best suited to do that work by soliciting recommendations of organizations that have members who are part of an affected population group have prior demonstrated work with an affected population group and have the ability to rapidly implement programming in response to unmet needs resulting from the COVID-19 public health emergency from the following. So they're supposed to solicit recommendations from the following. Racial Justice Alliance, NAACP, Migrant Justice, Outright Vermont, the Vermont Center for Independent Living, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, NAMI Vermont, AARP, the Community of Vermont Elders, and other advocacy and service organizations assisting or comprising individuals at high risk of adverse outcomes from the COVID-19 pandemic based on factors such as race or ethnicity, immigrant status, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, age, and geographic location. Would have the department in consultation with those organizations identify population groups that were not served by the subgrants awarded under the prior act or that were only partially served and are still in need of assistance. Then it would direct the department to award grants to the organizations it finds upon recommendation of those listed organizations as those best suited to provide outreach and assistance to the population group, groups most in need. The department must allocate the grants which could be awarded to one or more of those, those listed organizations as follows. And then it would put out a 
to be determined percent among organizations recommended by the Racial Justice Alliance, NAACP, and other organizations focused on issues of racial equity, a specific percent among organizations recommended by migrant justice and other organizations focused on migrant workers' rights, a set percent among organizations recommended by Outright Vermont and other organizations focused on issues of sexual orientation or gender identity or both, a set percent among organizations recommended by the Vermont Coalition should be Center for Independent Living, Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, NAMI Vermont, and other organizations focused on issues affecting individuals with disabilities, and finally, a set percent among organizations recommended by AARP, COVE, and other organizations focused on issues affecting older Vermonters. And that is the end of the language. Okay. So right, take it down for a bit. Sure. Yeah, that's that, but that's very helpful to have put that in front of us and we'll have it available. And again, that's language subject to further. I mean, that was to, that was to put something on the table in anticipation of the testimony today that we had not heard and but that we thought uh, we wanted to be prepared to see if we could respond in some way and particularly trying to identify at least preliminarily some of the uh, communities that we felt perhaps were not being fully uh, targeted through the targeted in a good way, uh, not fully responded to, let me put it that way, uh, through the grants that we were made aware of, but, but we've learned a lot more today. Uh, so uh, I, I'm going to, again, I'm going to jump in here and say that I think one of the things that uh, I think is missing from this language would be the geographic dispersion of, uh, of grants. And I think that that issue has been raised by a number of our committee members. And I think if we were to be able to add some language, uh, I think that would at least that would be responsive to some of the questions I've heard here today. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, because I think that anyway, so I'm going to I'm going to personally make that suggestion. And now I'm going to turn to questions uh, or comments from committee members, uh, Representative Durfee, then Representative Page and Representative Reed. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I uh, just a couple of things. I'm not clear on the the how the ELC might work in to uh, address some of the issues that have been raised. Uh, I I'm, I'm also wondering about the timing. I, I guess I'll just say first of all, or ask first of all whether and this is the timing question: Have the grants already been uh, distributed or allocated, and what's what's expected there? Uh, everything has to be spent by December 30th. Does that mean that the sub grantees have to have all been awarded the money by then? Um, and and also just thoughts on what the time frame between now and December 30th allows for what we're discussing here, envisioning for you know additional funding. Mm -hmm. Can I answer please, a couple of please. those questions? Yeah, um, let, let's let's recognize that we have a half hour left, and we had some other work to do. But I but I bringing some closure to this today was is really important. I think um, this is really exciting. To um, thank you for that language, and I think uh, it's really helpful that you've done the work to identify, you know, the advocacy agencies that that were not met with this funding. Um, to answer your question, Representative Durfee, the uh, the time frame is challenging. I think what, what the health department wants to do is support agencies that we know can act quickly that have kind of, you know, sophisticated administrative processes that can accept an award and get started on programming right away. Um, so that's one thing we, we'd look to is to not kind of burden um, an organization. Sometimes if it's a small organization, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the span of four months is, is going to be um, maybe actually even harmful to, you know, to their um, programming. So we just want to have an eye to that. That said, I think there are a lot of organizations poised right now to act quickly um, and that this language is specific in places, but broad enough that um, I think a lot of the direct services that the agencies you identified, guide, um, they're already happening and that we could support and bolster them. Um, I know there are concerns about the time frame, but I, I really think that we could work with that. Okay. And, and do ELC grants at all uh, duplicative or potentially well, recover, address any of the concerns? Yes, here? Uh, yes, and and I, it brings up a 
another issue that I don't think we have time for today, but maybe some questions from, from me to your committee later um, around kind of assessing what other um, coronavirus relief funding has been allocated to other agencies and departments because we want to be attentive to not duplicating. Um, mm -hmm. So as you see, you know, one note is the AALV and CRI received a $700,000 chunk. Wonderful. Um, we want to make sure that we're not writing the exact same grant, you know. Um, so I think I need to do a little bit more homework on the ELC. My understanding is that was a two-year um, grant for us. And I don't know when it started, probably this summer. Um, but let me get more clear on like what the um, wh what the plan is around health equity and community engagement within that language, how much money is appropriated, and what exact activities it will support. I think there is potential for over. Um, and and that, that, if I understand that, that grant does not necessarily operate within the same time frame restrictions and may very no. well allow some some work that goes beyond the December 30th. There, there actually might be a way to actually complement each other. Absolutely. Uh, but I, I'm That's not sure I have all the information either, but you, you would get us that. You can get us that. Yes. What, and, and, and let me, let me be clear. What, we're trying, what I'm trying to achieve here today is some language to pass on to the Appropriations Committee so that, and we, we can continue to um, think about refining uh, but if we have language that's broad enough but specific enough to make some direction uh, and to say this is go this would go into the House recommended budget and then it goes to the Senate and as we know things things continue to get modified so perfection is not our goal today but our goal is to try to see if we can't move something forward that would supplement in a way would supplement further what we've already what's already been put in motion and that would continue to be consistent with what this committee's concerns have been. Is that, I think that's clear. Representative Page and Representative Reed. Yes, um, I have no problems giving additional money, CRF money to okay. the health department, okay? Let me be clear on that. Okay. I do have some issues. You, you there, just speak up, Woody. Yeah. I, I have some issues with this bill. And there are some agencies that I, I'm sorry, but I just cannot support. And I was wondering, is it, is it necessary that we list those agencies? Okay, I think what we're, so I'm gonna. So that's, that's my, my That's comment. your question, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Donahue, I see your hand that wants to respond to this specific question of Representative Donahue, or Representative yes, just Page. Yeah, just to respond, the these that list is not the list of people to receive the funding. It is the people who are kind of in touch with some of those groups to ask them to recommend um, the groups that might be best suited to meet what we want to have done with the money. So that list of that list of organizations is not for the purpose of giving them the money. It's to hear the voices of the affected communities in terms of where they think uh, it would be best used for the purposes that we've outlined. So I, I don't the, know if that helps. If that's the case, Anne, then the language needs to be maybe a little more clearer in the bill if possible. Yep, that's what Jen's here for to listen today, but that, that is the intent, just so you know. Okay. Yeah, uh, Representative Reed. So Jen, can you be thinking about that as we continue to? Yes, I'm looking at the language right now to see if I can make it clear. Okay, uh, Representative Reed. So I, I, I definitely am supportive of, of broadening um, this to include some sort of rural um, geographic issues. Um, I, I, I can't think off the top of my head of an organization that might provide uh, guidance there. Maybe uh, BCRD might be one option. Um, but uh, uh, I, I also translate, question, BC, translate BCRD uh, for my council on rural, rural development. Yes, thank you, thank you. I just it wasn't immediately coming to my mind. They so. may be more of an economic than than a healthcare, but uh, it may all tie together. Um, I, I guess I question whether we actually need a list with percentages. That seems a little too prescriptive. Um, mm -hmm. And finally, I wonder if there's a way to reference the task force recommendations, even though we haven't seen them formally. Based on what we've heard today, it may be a nice way to tie that together and may build some additional support for uh, getting the funding. Mm -hmm. uh, That's it for me. 
Okay, thank you. And that makes me, that reminds me in terms of uh, the recommendations from the task force to speak to one of the recommendations I believe had to do with establishing a, um, a Vermont fund to fund uh, Vermonters who did not, who were not made eligible at the federal level for stimulus money. And I believe to just to say, I think maybe everyone is aware, but there is a parallel process happening right now in the House Appropriations Committee. The governor recommended a two or $2.5 million fund. And I believe our House Appropriations Committee, based on what I've heard and been communicated, is looking to increase that to $5 million uh, as part of the House Appropriation budget recommendation. Uh, so that I, I thought we should at least acknowledge that as we looked ahead. But I think um, maybe Dr. Avila, is it, might it be appropriate to, to include some language where there's an intersection of the recommendations of the uh, Racial Equity Task Force with the uh, ability to respond using CRF dollars in this time frame? Uh, would you comment on that if, if that might how you see that, if that's appropriate or how that might be useful or not? I think similarly to what um, Sarah mentioned, um, my biggest concern as, um, as a citizen more than um, um, a health equity scholar is the time frame to spend the funding. That's gonna be tricky if it is by December 31st. Uh, during the conversation, I've been writing down groups that I think we have gaps in providing services related to health disparities. It's clear that LGBTQI is one group that we need to be focusing on and maybe moving away from naming the organizations and possibly naming the communities and populations that we need to be focusing on can help um, change that um, description in the language. Another group is disability. The Racial Equity Task Force did receive um, a letter from several disability organizations advocating for looking at disability health disparities and intersecting disability and racial disparities because there are enormous health disparities if you are a person of color and have a disability in the state of Vermont and nationally. The other group is migrant farm workers. I think we need to be expanding. Um, I'm glad to hear that that's gonna turn into $5 million. That was also a letter that we received in the Racial Equity Task Force uh, advocating for that funding. And I don't want to forget um, the native people and Abenaki people. Absolutely. We generally forget um, um, about our native communities um, and we are all on a stolen land, so we need to acknowledge that this is Native American Abenaki uh, land, and most often we forget about um, Native communities that um, have a pretty high risks and needs uh, related to, to health disparities and even behavioral health disparities. So I think keeping those communities in mind, and I would even add elders, uh, whether it's elders at the intersection of racial diversity, disability, there are so many aspects that coronavirus has resurfaced for us as a society that we need to be paying attention more to elders. I mentioned I'm an educator, so when I teach, I always talk about when we allocate funding and when we cut funding at the federal level, we generally cut in early childhood and in elders, and we don't focus on our future and our past, and that's what we need to be focusing on, especially because elders are our fastest growing healthcare population. So I think those are some of the populations that, um, and we have organizations working with all of these groups that are statewide. So that will allow for an equitable distribution of resources. And as all of you mentioned, um, poverty and rurality of many communities that don't have access to Wi-Fi or internet, that's another barrier that is connected to health disparities and accessing care. I hope that um, answers some of the, the questions uh, related to some of the barriers. I think that your comments are very helpful in terms of uh, articulating. They, there's an overlap, but, but clearly you've further articulated some of the important areas that have not been fully addressed in the current proposals. Um, and I think that, um, there may, you know, there may be a way to reference like communities uh, rather than organizations, but it also might be helpful to rec to acknowledge some organizations for to which there would be should be specific outreach, uh, and uh, 
but we're, we're obviously not going to manage this from the House Health Care Committee. But I think our concerns were that some of what we are hoped for uh, outcomes were not getting fully, fully realized and that we may have an opportunity here to, to expand that and uh, to take it further. Um, Representative Donahue. And then I, I, then I, then if Representative Page, if you have a further comment, hear from you. No, your hand is still up. So just to say, and then I, then I think I have a, an idea of how to proceed. <laughs> I hope I do. I, I agree. That was that was uh, very helpful, and it's hard when you don't have the language to keep in front of you. But I think the idea of naming the population groups is there. That that listed group was just for these are folks to get. Uh, input from, and there's one category that says, and and others as well. I, I think um, the indigenous populations indigenous are really critical, one people, that we don't have on that list. Specific. So we, we need quick brainstorming on, you know, who, who would be the right group to name as make sure we outreach specifically to get input on who might uh, provide services, because they're clearly a gap. Um, that and geographic are, I think, the two big gaps because we do have the elders, we do have disabilities, some of the others that you mentioned, but we do not have uh, indigenous. So I'm, I'm just going to dive in here for a moment and just say, and this is a little bit coming out of my own background, but I think when we talk about sexual orientation and gender identity, that, that's very important. But I think we need to also recognize the LGBT youth. Uh, whether you want to, however, whatever the acronym is you want to use today, LGBTQIA+, or queer trans youth, are a particular group within that, within that community, within, frankly, the community I'm a part of, uh, that, that we recognize on every measure is at high risk. And I think that it would be a, a tremendous mistake if we did not uh, actually try to do something specific in that direction. That's not to exclude LGBTQ elders, et cetera. And, there, and, and I think Dr. Avila's uh, comment that there's, a, there's an intersection and a cross, cross uh, community issue for many of these groups uh, that you, 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 you fall within not just one group, but in multiple groups. And when you're in multiple groups that are all in groups of disparity, healthcare impacts, it's just amplified. Um, so I'm looking at what we have for time, and it's 12.15. Uh, I think it's probably uh, not realistic to ask Jen to recraft language, but we've made some, I think, some very important and helpful suggestions. Uh, but I don't think we should try to recraft language between now and 12.30. Uh, but I think what we could do and what we can do and still meet our commitment to the House Appropriations Committee and our commitment to this committee is to uh, hear further comments. I'm, I'm taking as a, I'm going to operate on a, my sense of the committee as much as I can get a sense of the committee from Zoom, but I'm hearing uh, comments from many of you uh, that there's a general sense that we would move forward to making a recommendation for some additional dollars. Um, what we haven't talked about is an amount of dollars, uh, but uh, I think that uh, we should, so I'm going to suggest that rather that if there are other comments in terms of uh, ways to articulate the additional need uh, or the additional process, uh, all with, you know, has to happen within the reality of this is currently has to be done between now and December 30th, that we hear those comments and then try to integrate those and that we then circulate amongst the committee and, and would then circulate because of our witnesses here today, uh, circulate with them, with you as well, the language of a proposal that this committee would then uh, uh, likely take or would be taking to the House Appropriations Committee by the end of today. The, not meaning that it can't be further modified along, we all recognize things change along the way, but I think we should try to have something that we can, uh, that the m majority of committee or everyone in the committee can get behind. Does that, I'm, I'm throwing that out to committee members as a process uh, that we hear further comments uh, and 
tried to complete our work through an email exchange late throughout the day and would invite uh, our witnesses to review with us the language that we, we would be proposing as well. If you're open to being our assistant, our consultants, we, that would be great. Um, Representative Gina and then Representative Donahue. Thank you. I don't have an exact uh, amount to propose, but I wanted to just propose that when we look at the appropriation that we're making of CRF money to address health disparities, that we look at that it's somehow tied to the um, to the proportion in the disparities. Like for example, if one percent of Vermonters are BIPOC, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, but eleven per but eleven percent of COVID cases, then does that mean that it's affecting those communities 11 times more? And if so, that proportion should be incorporated in the spending. So I'm not saying that it's, it should be like that we should spend 11 times more, but we should look at that impact when we're spending the money. And because um, I think that there's some significance to that. And, and include, can I suggest that a way to achieve that, Brian, might be, or represent China, might be to have some language to uh, reflect uh, proportionality of, I mean, some type of proportionality language rather than a specific percentage. At one point, I think there was some thought of like a percentage for this, a percentage, but like some proportionality language, would that address what you're thinking of? That's what I meant. And I was using BIPOC as an example, but I, yes. I would suggest we do that for every group we're looking at, that we look at the, um, the proportionality. Yeah, well, without getting lost in, I mean, we could spend days trying to figure out percentages, but I, that, I think I hear, I hear your concept, yes. And I hope Jen might take that and think about it. Uh, Representative Donahue. Well, that is perfect segue. That's what I wanted to address also is I, I think it was David who was saying this idea of percentages might not be workable. I think we we have language about um, um, groups that didn't get, uh, you know, to pay attention to groups that that uh, were sort of left out in the first allocations. And so if, we're, if we combine that with proportionality, I think we we meet what the percentages might have had to might have been focused on without um, making it too um, restrictive. Okay. Um, I see some other hands. Uh, Representative Chino, is your hand still? No. Nope. Uh, Representative Christensen, I'm going to turn to you. Okay. When we talk about proportions, we're talking about geographic and as well as older. Vermonters? It's a very good question. And if I can chime in, I just, I think that, you know, we would obviously need to have the data to support that. Um, and so I want to check with our data team. We obviously have, you know, race and ethnicity, but some of these subpopulations in terms of, you know, when folks are getting tested or admitted, we don't, we don't ask, um, you know, for instance, sexual orientation or, you know, so some of this no, may be kind of unknown. not going to be able to do. Right. In terms of that direct proportionality. Right. But I also, I'm, I'm wanting to, I don't know if Woody, your hand is still up or if, but it is. Okay, well, can I make, can I pick up on a comment you made earlier first, and then we'll hear from you? Um, that I think there's something to be said for also some outreach and perhaps grants, as, as Representative Page said, we don't want this to get worse where we are. And so they, to have the only measure of outreach be that there is current significant impact. I mean, there's different ways to measure importance of reaching out. Uh, and I think that uh, you begin to, it's a little bit like the question, I think that Representative Christensen asked at one point, well, were things distributed because there were already resources there? It becomes a chicken and an egg thing. It's like, oh, well, or I don't know if chicken and eggs is the right me metaphor, but you know, where there's resources, oh, we'll give more people because they have resources to do it. And therefore, you don't get resources. It's like, you know, that's, so I think it's similarly, or there's somewhat similar issue of if there's not an impact in certain parts of the state now, we want to keep it that way. And, and that, and that there's something to be said for uh, understanding that as well, rather than just looking at the COVID-19 testing data as what drives, drives this. So Woody, I, I'm sorry, I just kind of was picking up on something you said earlier, but. Thank you, Chair. Let me hear. Uh, just a quick item, just a quick item, um, and, and perhaps the education department is handling this, but um, is, there, is there a need for 
recognition of foreign students. We talked about LGBTQ youth. Um, is, there, is there a need to recognize um, foreign students or foreign youth? Uh, we've mentioned uh, our elders, um, and I'm just throwing that out. Students, students who are here for educational purposes in Vermont, but from from uh, different cultures. Right. It could be college. It could be. I don't know whether we have any private schools, uh, you know, or public schools where some of these students are here. Well, we do. We do, in fact, and I can think immediately of St. Johnsbury Academy. Well, that's true. Yes, thank you. And where St. Johnsbury Academy often draws students from other <laughs> other countries and other cultures. I mean, that's the one that comes to my mind. It's a yeah. private, private but public high school, both. So uh, we may want to include that. I don't know. So. <laughs> Make some allowance for that. Yep. Okay. So I'm just going to go out on a limb here and put a dollar amount on the table. What do folks think about a million dollars? That would then uh, allow this process to move forward, but recognize that that's a figure that could change along the way, clearly. Uh, but it was a figure that we started with as a committee. Uh, we hear that there's a lot of outreach that's been done, and but we also hear that there's a tremendous need, and a tremendous unmet need, and that the dollars have uh, actually been a restriction in terms of being able to do as much outreach as possible. Um, whether we would whether we would end up with that dollar amount at the end of the day, um, I can't say. But I would like to at least say that I think if we put a million dollars on the table right now from our committee, that that would then position us uh, to be able to begin to respond in a more significant way. Um, and that we would advocate for that. I would recommend that we consider advocating for that dollar amount to our House Appropriations Committee and then see where the process takes us. And this, as I say, this is an opportunity. Uh, Representative Cordes and Representative Smith. If we're thinking we would prefer to end up with at least 1 million, would it be better to um, uh, act like we're negotiating and start with two or three million. I know approps will see right through that probably, <laughs> but I know I think we do want to give more um, than a million, but I wouldn't want to start out being shy. I think a million is not being too shy. <laughs> um, but Perhaps we can have some continuing conversation about a dollar amount. Representative, Chris, uh, Representative Smith and Representative Christensen. Uh, a million dollars is a good number to start with. Like Representative Carter was just saying, we're not, we're not, but we're not trying to buy a car. So appropriation is going to know if we ask for a million uh, that that's what we want. Uh, but would you want to take that million dollars and divide it by fourteen? 14 counties in the state of Vermont. That's one uh, <laughs> quick and dirty way to do it. <laughs> uh, it's, it, that's, that's one way to approach it, but I, one would question. I seriously that. doubt that would happen. Uh, I, I think that's right. I just wanted to mention that, that's all. Okay, we hear you, we hear you. Representative Christensen. In a weird sort of way, it piggybacked <laughs> Representative Smith's comment. Of, um, <laughs> can we be sure that the tried and true, you know, the people who do get the money, don't get more money and still have the geographic location being left out because there's no advocates? Because often, often what I hear, when I hear of grants, I send them to appropriate places saying, hey, apply for these grants, they're great. And um, people will say, we just do not have the people to apply for the grants in this deadline. Or the and capacity. My, yeah, and that's my main question. But the other one is, will you be able to spend a million dollars by the end of the year and get it out the door? Or is some gonna be just left on the table December 30th? 
Can, can I just say that without having the health department have to answer that specifically right now, that is the case all across the CRF dollars uh, in the state. And there's a provision in every, every uh, application that, for, first of all, that the dollars have to meet the conditions of the, of the uh, COVID fund, CRF dollars has to be COVID related, has to be auditable. The state has a process uh, of uh, trying to ensure that the work that's being suggested or contracted for is meets the guidelines, but that also if the money is not able to be allocated or used in the in, in the period prior to December 30th, that there is a reversion process that I believe uh, the Joint Fiscal Committee or some other combination will, will be responsible for trying to see if there's a reallocation so that we don't leave dollars on the table that we can avoid. Because there may be a greater need in one area and that it can't, as an example, I, I've heard, I, I'm, I'm, we, we don't need to go into examples now, but I know that uh, some departments of state government were allocated some dollars and they've said, we can't use it. And so that this is part of what the gov, this is part of what the speaker is trying to do right now is to say, we know that some areas have said they can't use their money. Is there new, do are there new dollars that could be allocated and should be allocated elsewhere? And that's what we're, that's what we're making the case for around health disparities. That's what we would be doing. And I would like to add briefly from a health equity perspective, when we allocate funding, um, I think the idea of county is important, but it has to be based on population density and also need within those populations. Another health equity perspective for allocating funding is looking at history of allocation of funding for specific communities compared to other communities. And the third piece specifically during a pandemic is looking at higher risk populations related to be proactive and work on prevention to be able to prevent any outbreak from happening again. So those are some of the pieces looking at history of allocation of funding. Sometimes people look at, you know, ALV, USRI receiving $700,000 and people think that's a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. We have never allocated funding to those organizations for the longest time in Vermont. So I think we need to look at the history of allocation how much funding compared to the, the rate of the population that is going to be served, and then the high risk or risk for uh, being able to be more vulnerable in these uh, times. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, um, Lord, Representative, Representative Houghton, yep. All right, I just wanted to uh, say that I found this conversation very, very uplifting in a time in the world where not many things are. And I want to thank our witnesses and Representative Lippert and Donahue for their leadership on this. Um, I think that the thing that I most want to make sure remember is that um, this doesn't stop on December 30th. And someone else mentioned, I forget which witness, I apologize about the social determinants of health. And I would hope when hopefully we're all around the table again next year that we can continue this and um, and not just have it be COVID focused. Thanks. Thank you. I, I heartily uh, agree and second your, your comments. So I think this, this, has, been, this has been a productive uh, process from what I can see. And I'm going to suggest that given our time, we're, we're gonna run out, we're running out of our time, that we, uh, uh, that, I'll, I'll say I that I that I work with Representative Donahue, Representative Houghton as the leadership of the committee to work with Jen Carby to recraft the language in a way that takes the feedback that we've heard here today, tries to recraft it uh, in a manner that allows us to move forward. Uh, that we distribute that language throughout the day uh, through our own email to our committee members. Uh, that we try to come to some closure and consensus in that process and that we share it also with uh, uh, our witnesses and that we then, with the, with the goal that by the end of uh, today, uh, we have a proposal that we would then submit to the House Appropriations Committee as our healthcare committee recommendations for additional CRF dollars to be uh, allocated specifically now around uh, health disparities and COVID. That Represent, sounds Rep excellent. Representative Rogers. Um, yeah, I just had a quick, a quick 
thought I in, in just thinking about the discussion around geographic disparities and I feel like it's a little unresolved as to what we would recommend on that but like just thinking through my own because I've been following this closely over the last few months you know one of the big issues that comes up for me with geographic disparities is the way that testing is accessible differently to people in Chittenden County or near a UVM network hospital versus other areas of the state. And so I, which isn't necessarily so much a money question, but it is a Department of Health question. And so I'm wondering if there might be room for some language as opposed to dollar appropriations, but language surrounding ensuring that testing is more equitable for people who are, who are essentially in Chittenden County um, and a few other locations versus in the more rural areas of the state. Right. I, I mean, I have to stop. I, I'd want to reflect on that for a minute, but I don't see any reason why that couldn't be reflected in some way. And I think that would be consistent both with the health disparities recommendations of the task force um, and, and the geographic issues that you're raising as well. And, and Representative Donahue, did you have your hand I, up? Yes, uh, because we're out of time, I just wanted to remind or ask, do you want to say 30 seconds on the fact that we need to get placeholder language elsewhere I, that is solely I th placeholder? I think, I think I'm going to just say this. Uh, we, I have, I've had crafted some placeholder language around what we're taking up tomorrow, which has to do with the Department of Public Safety uh, proposal around uh, adding mental health counselors to law enforcement. Uh, and as I said in my email memo to committee members, that is something which the speaker has asked our committee to take the lead on. We will begin that tomorrow by hearing from the commissioners of Department of Public Safety, Public Health, and then from uh, Representative Christie uh, from the Social Equity Caucus and the Judiciary Committee from their work of hearings and the survey that has been done. Uh, and the placeholder language is simply going to uh, suggest that the dollar amount as determined by the Appropriations Committee, this is not for us to choose at this point, but the dollar amount that they determined would have been in the Department of Public Safety proposal uh, be the place language, placeholder language would simply say that that dollar amount would be allocated to the Department of Mental Health for uh, further distribution to address additional mental health crisis response in communities in a manner that would be of assistance to law enforcement. And that that, that language uh, would allow the budget to move forward, holding, that holding those dollar amounts, uh, holding those dollar amounts uh, for a further proposal that would then come from our committee after our tomorrow and next week's testimony uh, that the, that we would then forward to the House Appropriations Committee to take into their conferencing with the Senate, and I, I will just we'll distribute that language. I don't think it's language that's. Uh, I, I think well, th we, that's that's what needs to happen at this point. I can just just for background let people know the language is mostly drawn from the specific proposal that DPS had put forward. So it's. But, but I think it's very important to understand as well, it's language which the speaker has recrafted, yes. that the speaker of the house has said, and in directing our committee to take the lead, has said we, this is because of concerns around law enforcement and mental health, this is money to be distributed, to be allocated and distributed to support communities around crisis mm -hmm. where law enforcement may likely be engaged uh, and it's to support crisis response within communities around mental health issues. It's not monies to be allocated to law enforcement for them then to allocate. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a difference in framing. Yep. Is that fair to say, Ann? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So I'll distribute that language and we, we can, we, we're, we'll, we're then gonna be hearing testimony tomorrow and having committee discussion and then we're gonna have further testimony and I realize we're running over, but Demis, did you, one of the other things that I concluded was that we needed to have an additional committee meeting next week. Did that get communicated to committee members at this point? Yes, I sent an email. I, 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 I'll be honest, there's been a flurry of activity and thank you. I, I just didn't confirm that. So 
Uh, if you haven't checked committee members, we have, I have asked and we have been granted the ability to have a third meeting next week. Uh, that includes a meeting, I believe on Tuesday between 3.30 and 5, I think it is. But uh, check, Demis has, has, has communicated that to everyone. Okay. Well, with that, I, we've run over, but I want to really express my deep appreciation uh, to Sarah Chesborough from the Department of Health. You've been very helpful uh, in responding to our questions and uh, to Dr. Uh, Avila for your deep expertise and uh, help in understanding both the task force recommendations, but uh, equally important to understanding some of the deeply important uh, dynamics uh, involved in health disparities. And we, I look forward to, and I think we as a committee look forward to working with you uh, uh, significantly beyond December 30th. And, 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 and in the meantime. <laughs> so uh, with that, I think I'm going to suggest we bring this to a close and that we will then distribute, uh, we'll, we'll look at some craft, crafted and recrafted language and uh, see if we can't come to some, uh, I think I'm confident we'll come to some closure by the end of the day. Okay. Okay, you ready to go off live stream? Uh, let me do one last thing. I realize I have been not monitoring the chat closely and see if there's anything that... Uh... Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Avila. Yes, there's, there's a number of recommendations that you made in the chat, and uh, we will um, be... Uh, and I think others have some thoughts there too, so... Thank you all. I think with that, we'll, we'll conclude our meeting for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.